So we have the first important theorem of our section, the spanning set theorem. So to get us started, we have, we want to let S be the index set of vectors, vector V1 through vector V sub P in some vector space V. And we also want to go ahead and let H be the spanning set of this set of vectors V sub 1 through V sub P. And the spanning set theorem tells us that if a vector V sub K in S is a linear combination of the remaining vectors in S, or a redundant vector, then the set minus this vector still spans H. The second half of our spanning set theorem tells us that as long as H does not equal the zero vector, some subset of S is a basis for H. So these are two important statements here, so two important statements here that we need to go ahead now and prove. So let's take a look. So in the proof of part one here, we want to show that set S not vector V sub K still spans H. So we begin by considering some arbitrary vector X in H. And so the goal here is to show that this arbitrary vector X can be rewritten as a linear combination of the preceding vectors. So since H is equal to the span of vector V1 all the way to vector V sub P, we can rewrite X as follows. We can say that vector X is equal to C sub 1 times vector V1 plus C sub 2 times vector V sub 2 all the way up to vector V, oh, excuse me, this should be C sub P minus 1 times vector V sub P minus 1 plus C sub P multiplied by vector V sub P such that C sub 1, C sub 2, all the way up to C sub P minus 1 are weights or scalars. So now what we want to do is go ahead and pick some vector V sub K such that it's a linear combination of the other vectors. So we want to pick some arbitrary vector V sub K such that it is a linear combination of the other vectors. And then just for notation purposes to make this a little bit easier on us, let's go ahead and we'll let vector V sub K here be equal to vector V sub P. So we can rewrite vector V sub P as scalar A sub 1 times vector V1 plus A sub 2 times vector V sub 2 all the way up to a sub p minus 1 times vector p minus 1. And this is such that all of these a's, a sub 1, a sub 2, all the way up to a sub p minus 1, are again the weights or the scalars. All right. So at this point, what we're going to do is take this vector v sub p and substitute it into vector x to show that we can rewrite this as a combination of the preceding vectors. So we're going to go ahead now and substitute vector VP into vector X and we'll be able to simplify. So I have vector X is C sub 1 times vector V1 plus C sub 2 times vector V sub 2, all the way up to C sub P minus 1 times vector P minus 1, plus, and this will be, oh, we should make sure to keep C sub P out in front, and this is now multiplied by A sub 1 times vector V1, plus A sub 2 times vector V sub 2, 
giving ourselves more room. This expands all the way up to a sub p minus 1 times vector p minus 1. And so now by the distributive property, we can go ahead and we'll take this scalar and we'll distribute it through to each term in v sub p. So this becomes c sub 1 times vector v sub 1 plus c sub 2 times vector v sub 2 plus la 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 all the way up to c sub p minus 1 times vector p minus 1 plus c sub p times a sub 1 vector v1 plus c sub p times a sub 2 times vector v sub 2 all the way to c sub p times a sub p minus 1 times vector v sub p minus 1. Phew! And now we can go ahead and we'll start grouping up our like terms. So we have the v sub 1 terms. We can see that we have the v sub 2 terms. And we continue all the way till we group together those v sub p minus 1 terms. So I have c sub 1 times vector v sub 1 plus c sub p times a sub 1 times vector v sub 1 plus c sub 2 times vector v sub 2 plus c sub p times a sub 2 vector v sub 2. And we continue all the way till our last term here. We have c sub p minus 1 times vector p minus 1 plus c sub p times a sub p minus 1 times vector v sub p minus 1. So lots of room here. So we can see that we can now factor out those common vectors. So in our first group, we have the common vector v1. In the second group, we have common vector v sub 2. And we continue with this method till we have attained a linear combination. So we have c sub 1 plus c sub p times a sub 1 multiplied by vector v1 plus c sub 2 plus c sub p times a sub 2 times vector v sub 2, all the way to our last term, c sub p minus 1, plus c sub p times a sub p minus 1, multiplied by vector v sub p minus 1. And so what we have here, all of these terms in parentheses are just the weights. So we have rewritten vector x as a linear combination of the preceding terms. So vector x is a linear combination of the preceding vectors. And that's what we've shown here. We also want to make a note in these preceding vectors. We should include our v sub 1, v sub 2, all the way to v sub p minus 1. And since vector x is arbitrary, we can do this for any vector our little heart desires. So we can say that since vector x in H is arbitrary, we can do this for any vector in S. So this allows us to conclude, to make that big final conclusion here. Therefore, the set of vectors v sub 1 all the way to vectors v sub p minus 1 still spans h. So in other words, this is telling us that s not vector v sub k which we've defined here as vector v sub p. So s not v sub p still spans h. And we have officially finished the proof for case 1. So for the second case of our spanning set theorem here, we want to prove that if h is not equal to the zero vector, then some subset of s is a basis for h.
So to get us started here, let's recall that by definition, B is a basis of a set H if B is linearly independent and if H is equal to the span of the set of vectors, B sub 1, B sub 2, all the way up to vector B sub P. So, since we have one of our initial conditions here, that H is the span of the vectors V sub 1 through V sub P, we can make a little love note here to ourselves that S is the original spanning set. So our second property of the definition is all set. And what we really need to concern ourselves with here is this first property, showing that B is linearly independent. So we're going to need to consider two cases for this proof. We need to consider case number one. Let's suppose that S is linearly independent. Suppose that S is linearly independent. Oops, we did it, right? Since H is the spanning set of the vectors, where S is the original spanning set, if we suppose that S is linearly independent, then by definition, S is a basis for H. And that is the end of case one. So if, again, we assume that S is linearly independent, then by definition, S will be a basis for H. So now we need to consider the slightly more exciting example, case two. Now we want to go ahead and suppose that S is not linearly independent. So in other words, Suppose that S is linearly dependent. And we'll have to give ourselves plenty of room here. So we want to suppose that S is linearly independent. So then by definition, we can rewrite one of the vectors in terms of the other vectors as we saw with the first part of this proof. So then, by definition, we can rewrite one vector in terms of the preceding vectors, or in terms of the other vectors. And again, we just proved this in part one. Then we have a new set that we need to consider, S not vector V sub K. And again, now that we have this new set here that we're thinking about, we'll need to consider two cases. And these are two new cases. So in case one, let's suppose that S not vector V sub K is linearly independent. Again, this is that straightforward case. If S not vector V sub K is linearly independent, then by definition, S not vector V sub K is a basis for H, and we're done. However, we can't assume that this S not vector V K is linearly independent, so we need to think about the next case. Suppose that S not vector V sub K is not linearly independent, 
or in other words, is linearly dependent. Then, so then like we saw in case one again, we can rewrite one vector in terms of the other vectors. Again, as we saw in, well, as we literally saw right above here, and we saw in the first part of this proof. So we have to continue repeating this step until all redundant vectors have been removed. So we must continue repeating this step until all redundant vectors are removed. And thus, we have attained a linearly independent set. So therefore, once we've repeated this enough so that all of the redundant vectors have been removed and the set is linearly independent, it will be a basis for H. So we can claim that once the set is linearly independent, so once the set is linearly independent, it is a basis for H. And that is the end of this proof.